Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take your questions now. Fiona, the assistant editor of uh, Cosmos magazine, uh, is holding the mic and she has a question. She will take your questions. There's a gentleman over there, I see, and then we can come I back. I have a line up already. I've got Heather first. She, she's oh, I see. There's yeah, a. But I'm coming, and then this gentleman, and then you. Okay, you've got to let control. Whatever, whatever <laughs> Fiona says. Well, this is a blinder in Claudia, I guess. Claudia, you, um, I think the big question probably a lot of people will be thinking about is ethics. Um, yeah. Because we're talking about, you know, I guess in the public imagination and science, which is potentially creating artificial life. You, you spoke before about the ability to manipulate cells and, and said, you know, we think of them as programmable machines. Sure. Um, are they, and at what point um, uh, can, we, can we make that kind of ethical decision, um, obviously it's different for what kind of different uses that they have. What, what's your thoughts about when it comes to the crunch and, and when you say, you know, we need, we need an ethical way of thinking about this or, hey, you know, we've just got to go out there and find out what we can do in the research first and, 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 and then make that decision. Yeah, sure. So, so firstly, I think the, the ethical side of things is really important and that has to grow and evolve along with the science as it grows and evolves. It's not something that you can sort of do retrospectively or try not to think about. And as scientists, we all have to engage with that. It's a really important part of doing frontier science and, and things that people aren't familiar with or, and, and aren't comfortable with. Um, in terms of, I mean, cells are most definitely programmable machines. That's how they work. I mean, so DNA is a code, and the code is decoded to a message, and the message makes it the protein, which is the, the workhorse of the cell. So for all intents and purposes, a cell is, is indeed a programmable machine. So I think that's, you know, almost an, an inarguable point. Um, in terms of the ethics, I mean, it's a new field, and it's developing as we go along, and we really have to be... You know, prepared and, and happy to engage with that and, and move with it. And there will be issues that, that come up and that we, we deal with as we sort of go forward in the science and, and we really have to be open and talk to the community about it and, and make sure that it's dealt with to the satisfaction of the community. Are you happy with that? Do you think, you know, hey, yeah, I'm not on this. You know, this is, this is, I know where the science is going and I know when the, the equity debate is going to kind of kick in and, and, and at what stage it's going to come well, I think, uh, I mean, I think that uh, Claudia is absolutely right in saying that this is something where the ethics have to evolve with the science. It's, it's far better for us to have the conversations right from the very beginning uh, than to try and have a conversation when the science is already very well developed. Um, so, um, if we think that, you know, it certainly is the case that synthetic biology is still in its early stages of development, um, and so now really is the time to sort of start engaging the public with issues, to, you know, to explain what synthetic biology is, to think about what the possibilities might be, um, and we're not going to be able to predict entirely at this stage what all of those possibilities will be, and we need to be upfront about that, um, and, and just, you know, continue to have those conversations with each other. Hi, um, I've learned all my science from Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the two episodes that was relate to this discussion are the trouble with dribbles, where you had those um, um, reproducing dribbles that filled up the entire space of everything on that um, limited um, spaceship. And also the, the, art, the, one, the episode in the Star Trek, the new generation, about nanites which got into the computer system and, and, um, and took over the ship until they were able to befriend the nanites and find a safe home for these, these new creature, creatures. So I'm, I'm rather concerned about this synthetic biology from an ethical viewpoint, as the previous question was, which I think is the key issue, one of the key issues here. Um, as, as, a, as a former scientist, as a, communicator, a science communicator, um, I know how science evolves, but I don't know how ethics evolve. And I think that's what you just said, ethics has to change to keep up with the science. Now, I just wonder if, if scientists need to be trained in ethics as part of their studies, or whether, if they take, on, if they take into account ethical considerations, will that limit their, their scientific research? Yeah, so we're starting to do that now. We're starting to train our undergraduates in, in ethics. That's definitely an option as part of the degree programs that we offer. Um, 
I think informed debate is a real key, so doing things like this where we all come together and, and ask questions and have open dialogue um, is really important, and, and just in flexibility in the way that we think and feel about things. Um, I'm also not an ethicist, so I, I don't really know a lot about how ethics changes and evolves um, as science changes and evolves, but I, I think um, just being willing to commit to it and be engaged with it is the most important thing. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the I haven't I was I didn't grow up with Star Trek. I haven't seen the two episodes that you talked about, but I think that um, though you know what Star Trek was playing off there is a fear that you know that is fairly widespread. I mean, since the days of Star Trek and probably before that, um, you know, that we will engineer. You know, if we play with living systems, that we'll you know we'll end up with something that gets out of control, right? And I think that is that it's a real fear. Um, but on on the other hand, uh, it should you know, and I think this is why it's so important that we have these discussions. Is that you know the public needs to understand that you know what you know, where that risk really is, right? So there are regulations that have been in place for a long time um, already, you know, to um, you know to control or to regulate the use of modified, genetically modified organisms, right? So we, um, so if, you know, if we're going to um, make an organism that kills cancer, let's say, and that's, that's a very real possibility, um, the level of testing that would have to be involved before something like that would actually become a therapeutic would be immense, right? Um, I mean, I don't think we've, uh, we've never had a, um, a treatment like that before, but obviously there is a, a well-established uh, protocol for um, for testing the safety of new drugs, for example, or new treatments in general. So I think obviously there will have to be, you know, well, maybe Belinda's in a better position, whether or not there has to be new laws to address a specific therapeutic that you know comes about as. Well, one of the, I, mean, I think one of the things that we do have to do is we're dealing with any new technology is um, to continue to look at the adequacy of our laws and to decide whether they still, um, you know, whether they're adequate to deal with the way the science has developed. Um, it may be that uh, our existing frameworks and our existing laws are perfectly adequate to deal with the issues that come up with a, uh, that are presented by a new technology. It may be that in time, though, that we'll need to adjust those laws to take account of new developments in the science or technology. Um, and so we need to be constantly looking at our legal frameworks and making sure that they are adequate. Um, and, and one of the key questions that I guess we need to decide is whether we do need to craft entirely new laws for a new area or whether we can build upon our existing frameworks and the sort of frameworks that Desmond's already spoken about that we have in place already provide us with a really solid foundation and we can then continue to monitor the way that the science is developing and this is part of the continued dialogue with scientists and ethicists and the public um, and make sure that our laws are, you know, continue to be adequate for, for uh, questions of risk. What's the difference between ethics and law? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Are you asking, like, is there such a thing as an ethical lawyer? <laughs> Come on. You know what, what's intriguing to me, Belinda, is, is um, nobody ever asks about the ethics of killing cancer. You know, where, where, where's the argument for protecting cancer? Nobody ever cares about that. And nobody ever asks, what about the ethics of putting ethics classes on? You know, forcing students to take ethics classes. What about that? Oh, These are all concerns. There's a uh, whole series of new, <laughs> new, dis new, you know, new discussions. New territories. Yeah. Uh, you have a question, sir. Uh, oh, hi, guys. Thank you for a fascinating uh, thing. I'm just an ignorant German graduate, but it seems to me that a million base pairs with a four letter alphabet is a quarter of a megabyte. So, it's, in terms of the IT, it's fairly trivial. And living organisms will poodle along doing their thing once you've got them going. So what we need in the middle is a kind of wet printer that will take this quarter of a megabyte, spit it out into a cell, and then it'll go. So how far away is this wet printer? Uh, because that's when the revolution is going to happen. When we can take, we can prototype something and just you know, spit it out into a petri dish affordably and, and in real time. And, and what's going to happen when the terrorists get hold of it? <laughs> it's uh, really close. Yeah. 
Okay? <laughs> Let's shout. <laughs> <laughs> so the wet printers that you're talking about do exist. Yeah. Um, you can make um, uh, oligonucleotides with a ma with it's machine. It's DNA. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so you can make very short DNA sequences of maybe 20 or 30 base pairs um, from machines that you buy. Um, and in fact, you know, um, obviously this is one of these. You know, this is one of these concerns that. Um, you can buy those machines off eBay. Um, I've <laughs> you can buy you can buy lab a lot of the lab equipment actually off eBay because they're allowed to can offload them. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we bought we bought equipment off eBay before. Great, <laughs> right, really cheap. So, um, so, so the wet printers do exist. Um, to be able to print, the, the problem is being able to print something that long, um, and at the moment that's incredibly costly. So the that. That printer, um, the ones that are, that we have at the moment, can't print something that long. Um, uh, what's what's happening is that um, the cost, uh, and, and you know, when this is really going to take off is when the cost of printing these uh, these sequences becomes low enough that it's it's within reach of sort of you know the average lab on a small budget or the average person on a small budget. Um, well, so the average terrorist knows more about it. Right, right, right. Well, no, so, okay, so at the moment you can synthesize a gene for maybe a few hundred dollars or maybe about a thousand dollars. And um, so a gene is typically about a thousand base pairs. So it'll be, at the current rate at which the technology is evolving, it'll be somewhere between about 10 to 20 years before we over sequence a microbial genome uh, for that price range. Um, if, if it continues to evolve the way that it's evolving. Um, you, mean, but, you mean build a microbial genome rather than right. right, 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 build a microbial genome. Um, and, um, and obviously, you know, if that happens, then that, that, you know, that will really change the game. Um, talking about the, the terrorist aspect, um, you know, it's, it, again, this is a valid concern because viral, viral genomes are very small. Um, so, um, theoretically, um, there's enough public information, oh, well, so you can find the sequences of a lot of viruses uh, uh, that are available, to, you know, on public databases. Theoretically, there's enough public information about the smallpox virus um, that you, somebody that is quite determined could, could synthesize that. So, so there is some regulation in the but, industry at the moment, though. Yes. So, I mean, you can't. I mean, at the moment, we get genes. We, you know, we clone by phone, right? We, well, we email, you know, because we prefer that, and we're not very good at talking to each other. But um, you, you sort of email the company and say, "This is a sequence that I want," and they make it for you because it's, yeah, you know, it's too labour intensive and, and too expensive to do well, yourself. And as has been said, that costs a couple of hundred dollars. But if you send them a sequence that's codes for a protein that's a known toxin, then they're going to come back and say, I don't think so. So you can't actually order things that are known toxins and, and dangerous um, things no now. If they didn't know it was a toxin, then maybe you could order it. So, the, the printers will yeah. become affordable, won't they? The printers will ultimately become affordable, but the, the ethical situation has changed. So I think... Um, I think it was Oppenheimer, and, and probably someone in the audience will correct me, who said when he saw the, the bomb in Hiroshima, said, uh, becomes the destroyer of worlds. Never, never realised or, or never really thought that that was the danger of the technology that, that was being created and that he was a part of creating. You know, we're not, we're not that naive, I guess, nowadays, where we're really sort of a bit more on top of it and, and a lot more careful and a lot more aware of ethics and, and of public... Um, sensibilities and also of, of bioterrorism. I mean, since 9-11 the world changed forever and we live in it now and we accept that and we, we respond to that. It, it was Oppenheimer and it was Trinity, the first uh, atomic bomb. Trinity, yeah. 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 I, I mean, there is a, a basic question that comes about with many technologies is, is sort of this dual use question. Right? So as, as we as the technology develops and we find good and productive ways to use that, we also have to think about how do we regulate or how do we put in the safeguards, the kinds of things that Claudia has talked about. So at the moment, you know, if you want to sequence a large chunk of DNA, it is out of the reach of 
the average person. Uh, and that's, you know, so a good place to do the regulation is at the companies or the facilities that do that. But as the technology continues to evolve, then I guess we have to keep assessing whether that, that's sufficient because there are bad people out there who like to use technology for bad things. But the, you said you said that you outsource that work with what? It's, it's a drudgery, it's hard to get it right, it's expensive, so you oh, just have a... Uh, yeah. um, and your argument was, is if, you, if terrorists use it, they're going to go to the same sort of thing. It's not necessarily easy to do. If they try and do it themselves at home, it's, it's not necessarily something you can just whack together in the cooking pot, is it? No, but I think right. the other thing that you need to keep in mind is that the technology for dealing with bioterrorism is also growing and accelerating. I mean, going to the airport, particularly if you're travelling in the States, it's, it's a different story than it was 10 years ago. Substantially different. So it's not like the technology is progressing and we're just not dealing with the bioterrorism side of it at all. There's an enormous amount of technology that's being developed to deal with that. We have a question from the floor. And then, and then we'll have some more from back here. Maybe one more after this. Is that cool? Yeah, sure. Yeah, cool. We've heard a lot about uh, genetics and genomics and the importance of that for doing all this synthetic biology. Is it uh, interesting or, or a part of your work to deal with proteomics? Yes. I work in this and the Systems and Synthetic Biology Group at the Australian Institute for Bioengineering and Nanotechnology. And systems biology is the, the science of looking at an organism as an entire system. So you look at the, it, it thinks a whole lot of different levels. So you look at the DNA, which is the code. You look at the RNA, which is the message. You look at the protein, which is the, the workhorse. So that's the proteomics that you're talking about. So, and you also look at the um, metabolism, so all the actual biochemicals that are moving around inside the organism. And you look also uh, uh, at the flux, so the flux ohm, so the movement of carbon through the biological system. So if you think of the cell as a network and um, almost like an electrical circuit or electrical complex electrical circuit where electrons are running through the system, carbon are the electrons of the biological cell and we look at the flow of, of carbon through that system as well. So these are all omics that you're talking about and the proteomics that you're talking about is in specific the study of the protein levels. So what's going on when the organism is responding to a different kind of environmental um, cue or whether you, if you change the organism by putting in or taking away one or several genes. And then you measure that response at the systems level and proteomics is one of those levels. Question the back, anyone? Anyone around the back has a question? Yeah. This gentleman down here. That's the clearest exploration of proteomics I've ever heard. <laughs> very nice visual there, the uh, carbon molecules as electrons of the uh, biological world. Very, very interesting way of looking at it. Hi. Uh, we heard a lot tonight about the um, DNA being a programming language. I'm a computer scientist by training, and to me, um, if there's a if there's a language, then it has to have things that make it a, a programming language, uh, which would be a vocabulary, a grammar, synthetic type, uh, semantic type, sorry, um, and so on. Uh, the question, my question is, how much of this language do we know? Yeah, it's like four bases long. It's the simplest language you came across. So I'm, I'm going to let Desmond answer this. This is really your speciality. It's, it's an extraordinarily simple code, and it's remarkable that so much genetic diversity can come from four bases. I mean, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. There's add-ons and, you know, languages that it interacts with, and so you can get different different coding languages speaking to, to so each that's other. About, that's just like saying that English is only 22 characters long. Yeah, that's right. But English is surely more than that. Right? Yeah, well, that's obviously a little more complicated because then you have languages and accents and you have local dialects and colloquialisms and all these interesting words that we come up with in Australia. But that's right, and DNA has the same thing. So there's little bits of chemical that sit on the DNA and change the way that they respond to you know, different environmental cues and such forth. But um, yeah, I'll let Desmond really elaborate on this. That's really his area. Right, well, so I mean, to have a working computer program, as you say, you have to have a way of interpreting uh, computer code, right? Um, and of course, at the most basic level, it's just some binary sequence. 
a code for instructions, and then you know these instructions cause you to do certain things. So when it comes to DNA, we know some of those instructions, but not all. Um, and so that's why we can't write, um, you know, we can't write a DNA sequence entirely from scratch and just say, okay, I want to know. And, and, and this is the dream, right? So the dream is, um, you know, you would say, I want an organism that does whatever. Then, you know, then um, I know completely what the code does. Um, so I'd write that sequence up. I'd get my wet printer. I would print that, and then I would put that into a cell. That may or may not ever happen, um, but you know, but that's certainly the sort of the, the you know the that's uh, the nirvana, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, the, the synthetic biology nirvana, right? Yeah, so what we're doing now, right, is we're trying to reverse engineer. It's like um, you sort of came along, you knew nothing about computers. Maybe you're a Stone Age person. And there's a computer sitting on the ground, and then you, you kind of work out what does it do and how does it work. That's that's what we've been doing with cells for the last, or for, with, or with with DNA for the last um, 100 years or so, and we're kind of getting somewhere now, but we, we've still got a lot to learn. Wow, Stone Age, huh? <laughs> um, any other questions? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Just to follow on from that. Um, Claudia, perhaps. Um, do you think that the, the focus on DNA over the last few decades has actually taken some focus off proteins and other aspects of biochemistry and perhaps taken us down a path that has slowed some of our learning in some of those other areas? So that's a really wonderful question. I'm glad you asked it. So, <laughs> so DNA is, is something that we can work with very, very easily and we understand quite a lot about it relative to the rest of the complex network. Um, as, as a metabolic engineer, I find that the most important part of it, the whole network system, is actually the pointy end of the stick. So that's not the DNA, that's what's happening all these steps down from that at the metabolome level. So what I was talking about before, the flow of carbon through the network, which is actually one step further down than, than the protein network, is the most important thing because you actually are really trying to make more of it, well in my case, an industrial biochemical. And if you want to make more of that compound, then you have to be able to measure it and you have to be able to redirect carbon into that compound. So that, that's really perhaps even more important than DNA. DNA is what you alter to try to get changes all the way down the network. And let me tell you, it doesn't work the way you'd like it to. A lot of the time when you make changes in the DNA, there's, there's so many steps between the DNA to the compound and the organism is so awfully good at stopping you from doing what you want to do um, that it's actually you know, far more important to be able to measure and analyse what goes on at different levels in the network. So DNA, I mean, the focus on DNA hasn't stopped us, I guess, from learning per se because we've really accelerated a huge amount in that area, but it's, it's certainly... Um, we're losing that focus now and moving on to perhaps more interesting and exciting areas in the network. So are you effectively hotwiring genomes? Is that what you're doing? Sure. Wow. <laughs> That's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> Question. Hi. Um, about six months ago, I saw a documentary movie. It's called uh, Food Inc. Uh, yeah. uh, and... Uh, it was really interesting, and uh, so when Desmond was talking about uh, we've been using uh, genetic modification in the past, but you didn't say how many years because you were interrupted before. So I was, oh, I was wondering uh, how many years we've been having that. And also, I actually stopped eating, eating chicken about 15 years ago because I have a sister, my older, older sister has chicken farm, and I know exactly what goes into the chicken. And uh, yeah, thousands of chickens in the cage, they don't even move. And one day I took one of the chicken to go just out of the cage and just tell the chicken to go for a walk. Can't even walk. Because it's basically a baby chicken, but pump up with all of this poison and disgusting stuff. Mm -hmm. And carry all this weight that it's a baby chicken that has to carry this weight. It's just, just disgusting. And so from that point, I just stopped eating chicken until now. I don't eat chicken anymore. 
So I just had chicken earlier. <laughs> you bet. So, so I'm, what, what I'm going to ask you is, um, do, do you have, in Australia especially, I don't care about the USA, but in Australia, <laughs> in Australia, do we have some kind of a rules or regulation? So, they or, they or you guys <laughs> don't go out of control, but you see all this kind of stuff with the chicken. So, thanks. <laughs> so, well, okay, so that's, a, that's a, Okay, so I mean, that's the first question about the history of genetic modification. So it really depends on how you count it. That because uh, we've been breeding. Uh, I mean, human beings have been uh, domesticating and selectively breeding living organisms since the dawn of time, or since you know the beginning of recorded history. Um, but. Um, in terms of things that we'd actually call genetic engineering, where we actually splice genes into, um, you know, into cells uh, or you know, into seeds, um, that's the last, I guess, two or three decades or so. Uh, I'm not wow. sure. Um, uh, yeah. Wow. Well, it's uh, called recombinant DNA. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not exactly. I'm not sure on the precise history. So uh, there may, there's probably someone who could. But you're right, because uh, you know, the whole food industry has been created by our intervention. So bananas were originally this big, yes, yeah. uh, you know, 5,000, 6,000 years ago. And a whole range of apples were this big. And, and it's through selection and modification using genes that are already in there that we've actually created the food groups that we currently take for granted. What's different is that we're taking, in genetic engineering, we're taking genes from things like fish and putting it in tomatoes or that's different. So, so I think that the question is really a bit more aimed at um, how do we regulate this technology and, and stop it from getting a, to a point you know, where the chickens are really at it at the moment. Isn't it? <laughs> well, really not a point that we really want to be at um, anywhere in the civilised world. Um, in Australia, specifically, we have some pretty strong regulations. It's not something that I'm an expert in. Um, around genetic modification, we have extremely strong regulations and extremely strict um, rules, and some, in fact, some of the most strongest regulations in the world um, relative to genetic modification. Synthetic biology is not at that stage yet where we're you know, releasing things at that sort of a scale into the environment, I guess. Um, and, and, and I think it's just sort of really important to, again, keep in mind that the, the ethical side of things does need to grow and evolve with the technology as, as we develop it. The reason that there are chickens in those environments that you talk about is because of this massive demand for protein and the enormous um, growing population that we have. Um, that, again, itself is an enormous ethical question. How do you deal with that? And, and, and you know, how do you deal with the fact that everybody wants to be living in a first world standard and, and that should everybody be living in a first world standard and should we, should we be living the way that we do ourselves? I mean, these, these are very complicated questions and it's a very long answer and I don't think that there's really a good answer yeah. for that that we can get to tonight anyway. But there's, there's a limit, right? How much you can, like, how much stuff you can put in the chicken? <laughs> yeah, so, so, um... You really focus on the chickens, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> Generally speaking, uh, we, the, the question we had earlier about computing made me, made me, re made me re realize that um, the stuff that you do with synthetic biology these days is really hair curling maths, isn't it? You have to do, um, like, I looked this up, stochastic, stochastic differential equations, Boolean networks, graph theory. It's, uh, it's not the sort of thing, I mean, there's nothing to do with chickens, is it? <laughs> I mean, that's actually one of the things that is very interesting about biology as a science and why, I, I mean, I was trained as an engineer and why I, I had no trouble answering that question is that, um, you know, biology used to be a very descriptive science, but I think now it is becoming, essentially, you know, at least part of biology is becoming an engineering discipline. So we use math to, or maths to, um, you know, to model uh, how living systems work, computers to decide how to, you know, make modifications. And so, you know, so making um, a microbe should be no different, in my mind, than <clears throat> making an airplane. 
Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, in the details they're very different, but in the process, you know, it's a very, it's a complicated thing that you know, we should use all the, you know, computer and mathematical tools that we can to, to assist in that process. So you model it inside the computer what uh, a biological system will do. Right, right, yes, that's a, that's a large part of my work. So now we have petri dishes for you. Uh, yeah, well, there, no, I also do petri dishes. So <laughs> at some point, you've got to, you know, the proof is in the pudding, so you've got to, got to make the pudding. Okay. This is actually something interesting we've touched on here, the internal warfare between the, the theoretical scientists and the real scientists, the experimental scientists. <laughs> so who's a theoretical, is he? <laughs> That's what we call them anyway. Okay. So he has theoretical advances, you have real advances. Is that how it works? <laughs> That's absolutely great. And we couldn't do it without him. So in the real world, as opposed to the theoretical world, in the real world, you're trying to do sucrose to bioproducts. Uh, is that a fancy name for making moonshine? What is that? <laughs> Well, actually, it, does, it builds on that, you know, because we've been using sucrose to make high-value products for a long time, you know, like, you know, Bundaberg rum and 4X, yeah, okay, those are not good examples, right? But we've been making high-value products out of, out of sucrose for a long time, and, and sucrose or sugarcane is an enormous industry in Australia, so you've got um, um, particularly Queensland and, and New South Wales, and it's uh, one of our largest ag agricultural exports. And it's trade on the commodities market and the price fluctuates and it's tough being a sugar cane farmer, especially in a, in a difficult year. And it would be much better if we could turn that sucrose, which is a sugar that we get from sugar cane, into a high value product that's worth 5, 10, 15, 20 times the cost of raw sugar. Why shouldn't we be selling that instead of trying to compete with the international sugar market? So you mean something more expensive than Bundy rum? <laughs> Something higher value than Bundaberg. So what would be the sort of thing? You see, you're not talking about alcohol, you're talking about something else. Yeah, so well, I mean, we're, we're, for example, we're looking at making jet fuel at the moment. Really? Jet fuel? Yes. And can you so drink that? Uh, well, maybe you can drink it. Wow, jet fuel. And you don't mean that quite like quite drinking. You mean really put into the jet and make it fly. Yeah, that's exactly right. Wow. Because yeah, so. that is quite expensive. It's highly processed. Uh, petrochemical base. Yes, yeah, petrochemical it? base. And then, so you're trying to replace petrochemicals? Yeah, very much so. So a lot of the chemicals and the biochemicals that we're making are replacements for petrochemicals. So we make biodegradable plastics that replace things that come from petrochemicals. I'm particularly interested in this compound called isoprene that I talked about before that you can make synthetic rubber out of. And the driver for that is the increasing cost of petrochemicals, um, the non-renewable issue that we have with petrochemicals, and of course the environmental issues. So all of these three issues we can address using a biological process. Now, in the theoretical world, um, Desmond, you're trying to you're trying to use microorganisms to, uh, to what's called on your website bioenergy. Is that like using microorganisms to convert solar power into fuel? Is that the same sort of thing? Right. Yeah. So I'm. Um... Well, I'm interested also uh, in using E. coli to make... Um, to that's make, a bacterium. That's a bacterium, yes, to make uh, you know, sort of complicated uh, compounds for fuel. Um, but that's, that's sort of a, an intermediate goal. So what, where we'd like to take it, of course, is to make an organism that directly takes carbon dioxide and solar energy. So um, there are organisms, obviously, that do that, algae do that. Um, Blue green algae cyanobacteria do that um, to take one of those organisms and make them make fuel compounds for us directly from carbon dioxide. And all sorts of fuel? What kind, any particular type of fuel are you working on? Um, I'm interested in making biogasoline, um, so just a direct replacement for gasoline and power. Wow. Some of the research projects, though, aim at um, making self-replicating self systems from entire synthetic components. That sounds a little bit spooky, Belinda. That sounds like the sort of area where we're crossing into that ethics legal concern. Well, I mean, obviously, but the first thing that we've got to do, and I think um, both Desmond and Claudia have uh, alluded to this already tonight, is decide on the definitional issues. So there's the question about what is it that we mean by synthetic biology? Uh, are we creating something entirely from scratch or are we taking something existing and, 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 and um, putting it into, in, into you know, a, 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 an existing cell? Um, and those definitional issues are really important because they help to set the parameters around what we, you know, how, we, how we might think about things, how we might decide to regulate them, what things will count as being included in any regulatory framework and what things will not, will not be included. So we've got to sort of make those 
clear definitional questions. And 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 the 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 issue that you've just raised is is one of um, trying to um, think through the questions about how we're going to manage issues of um, where the science might go and how we might manage issues of risk. Um, one of the things that that I think has um, that Desmond has been clear from the comments that Desmond's made tonight is the way that technologies are increasingly converging. So while we used to think about you know, information technologies, and we used to think about engineering, and we used to think about um, biology, and we used to think of all of these different areas as being quite separate. What we're seeing increasingly is that um, areas of knowledge and different technologies are all starting to converge. So the sort of advances that are happening around synthetic biology, just has been talking about the use of computers to sort of model uh, developments in those fields. And so all of these technologies are starting to um, come together and support each other so that we can kind of leverage off them to develop, uh, you know, take science further, actually. Now, that means that we need to think about these issues in ways where we acknowledge the convergence of those technologies and that we, we start to think about the way that those different systems come together rather than thinking in the traditional silos that we've often used in the so past. So you're, you're thinking the issue now that is... Synthetic biology is becoming a mosh, mosh pit of science. It's all <laughs> mixed up. Um, okay, let me give you a definition then. We're talking about definitional issues. The design and construction of new biological functions and systems not found in nature. That seems to me like a legal minefield. But one of the things I was thinking about is, um, okay, what if you invent an organism, you know, a novel de novo, as you like to, to say. You think you invent an organism and it does a bunch of stuff. And if it doesn't do that bunch of stuff, do you then sue the person who created that organism? Um, well, I mean, these, these are the things that we're going to have to work out on the on the scientific frontier, um, and that's why lawyers will still be there on the scientific frontier, I guess. Um, I mean, the, the, you know, the question is, what you know, what what are we aiming to have something do, and and, and um, in the early stages, we're still at the very early stages of science. We're not going to be able to promise for, for some considerable time that something will or will not do something in a commercial application. Um, so we're still very much in the early stages and we still just have to, you know, take it step by step. Claudia, you can use synthetic biology theoretically, right, to build engineered critters that process data that manipulate chemicals, that fabricate materials and structures, generate energy, create food, even repair human health. Is there anything that theoretically can't do? Or is it all biology, basically, you can replicate? Uh, um, is there anything that we can't do? Let me think. I think really our imagination is our only limitation. Uh, well, our imagination and, uh, and our technical capabilities are our, our, our limitations, and both of those things grow and, and evolve as, as the science grows and evolves and as the technology grows and evolves. So I wouldn't say that there's nothing we can't do. That sounds a little megalomaniac, a little bit despicable me, you know, but um, I think certainly there's, there's a lot of really fun and amazing things that we can do with it. But it's very blue sky. You're saying we're learning to crawl at the moment. But it's very much, we could be flying space shuttles. Um, I think we may be a little past the crawling stage, but we're not at the flying space shuttle stage yet. <laughs> okay, and yes? Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, we, you know, we kind of know, we have some of the parts, kind of know what we're doing, but we definitely don't have it down to a, a, a science. It's actually really exciting and wonderful to be part of this technology that is yeah. is growing and evolving. Yeah, the day as we as we walk in and sit at our desks, it's growing and evolving, and that's as you, as you hopefully not enormous, on your desk. Well, hopefully not on your desk. Yes, <laughs> an enormous privilege to be part of. Tell me, uh, so people often worry about the hazards of things, and I think science fiction plays a, a really good role in that. There's a gentleman who's mentioning Star Trek. Science fiction quite often is a way of us imagining the future, whether the you know the dystopic or the um, utopian uh, views of what, what might happen. But, you know, a lot of people do think about the imagined hazards before they've had the chance to consider the imagined benefits. What are some of the amazing things that you guys have thought about? You know, when you, when you take, put your lab coat, you hang up your lab coat, and you've gone home and you talk, talk about it at a dinner party, what are some of the amazing things you've thought about that, wow, we, could, we might one day do this? Can you give us some examples? Well, okay. Well, I think um, even though fuel is, I mean, before we get onto the really just, sort of, I mean, even though fuel is kind of boring, I would say that's probably 
the most important thing that we're working on at the moment. At a dollar twenty-four a liter, it's not boring. At a dollar twenty-four, we're paying a dollar forty. There you go. I'm not telling where I get mine. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, not the, the, that is the really cha the really challenging thing about biofuels is that in fact fuels are incredibly cheap. Uh, so you know, you, you go to the pump, you pay a dollar. You know, I don't know how much you pay in Australia for fuel, but uh, you know, it's uh, at, at the moment. But you know, it seems like it's not. It seems like quite a bit because you know you're comparing to how much you paid yesterday. Um, but you know, in comparison to a drug, you know, it, you know, the, what you get. You know, per liter of chemical is, is 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 very very cheap, and that's what makes making biofuels so difficult because we have to make. Um, I think, in order to make biofuels um, a, a viable alternative to fossil fuels, we have to make them cheaper. I think that's what will make people take you know use biofuels other than regulation forcing them, which I think is very unlikely. Uh, the only way to do it is to, is to make it cheaper. Um, in terms of the really exciting things that I think I, we can do, I think it'll be like, to so just imagine that a living cell is essentially a little nano machine. It's a small little thing, you know, a, a micrometer inside. Uh, anything you can imagine, like a little micro machine doing, potentially we can, we can make an organism that does that. Uh, and what's better about, you know, the organisms is that once we make one, once we've worked out how to make one of them, um, that, you know, potentially we can make as many of them as we want. Uh, they they self-replicate. Um, so, um, I think some of the really exciting applications are in medicine. So, uh, there's, we have no good ways uh, at the moment of really selectively targeting cancer. Uh, and, you know, if you can imagine that's something that we you want an intelligent little thing doing, that would be you know, an amazing thing. We could also make um, uh, microbes that go and find, you know, the nasty microbes that, you know, to the tuberculosis cells and do something to that. Right. Um, I mean, Personally, hail with health, that, that's yeah. really exciting. So yeah. when, we, when we get down to the thousand dollar genome, it, it actually becomes a reality. I mean, it's a little more complicated than that. It's, this is personalised medicine, where it's yeah. not medicine that works necessarily for me, but it works really well for you and yeah, a few other really people. Right. And, and when, once we have enough information knowledge to be able to actually look into an individual's genome, then we can use that information to treat them specifically. So instead of going in with a great big blunt hammer of a you know, some kind of drug like a statin or something that deals with your, your cholesterol problem, then maybe you can deal with that on a very specific individual level. I think that's, that's really That's important. what most people don't know, that drugs for it to work have to work on the largest possible group of exactly. people, which means they don't work very well because they have to work for very large groups of people, whereas there's lots of drugs that actually work really, really well on certain people, but not on the majority of people. So. Generally speaking, tailoring drugs to an individual would be brilliant, mm -hmm. wouldn't it? So I, I think that's a really exciting application. And also, um, doing things that we currently do in really dirty ways, you know, and, you know making energies is one issue. Um, but a lot of things that create industrial environmental pollution, doing those with biological systems is a much more promising way to be able to, to do that in an environmentally friendly Fashion. That's something I'm, I'm particularly interested mm -hmm. in, is being able to do, do things that, in ways that don't leave an enormous footprint on our world. I can see a situation where the gentleman was talking about bioprinters or wet printers. I can see a situation where somebody comes in, their genome's been done, you go, oh, you've got that, well, we'll just print you out a, a, a genome sequence that will just fix you up. Take this, take two, two of these and see me in the morning. That, that'd be brilliant world, isn't it? Gene That's therapy, a, yeah. Yeah, right, right on the money, right there yeah. in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that would be awesome. But then, of course, the legal implications. <laughs> <laughs> what if the printer wasn't working and that was bit, Oh, I pressed the wrong button. Hey, nothing to do with the printer's printer manufacturer's fault. Then, yeah. As I can see that you're right, Belinda. There's always going to be work for lawyers. <laughs> um, most synthetic biology um, is um, is really just biology, isn't it? Although, although you think that most synthetic biology is just really biology, and we're taking control and pulling the levers, but um, some scientists argue. Um, that actually we shouldn't be doing any of this, that there should be stringent containment of novel organisms and we shouldn't be releasing them at all. Have you heard this sort of thing? There are, there are concerns about this, are there? Yeah, I mean, look, I think um, the sorts of things that, that Desmond and Claudia have, have spoken about, the sort of, that, that's the sort of the promise and the hope for, for scientific advances. And that's the bit that we'd all like to have. We'd all like to have a great new fuel that could replace um, you know, petrol 
and, um, and, and, and that was you know, not polluting. Um, we'd love to have medicines that would effectively treat can cancer. Um, we all want those things. Um, and, and, and part of the question or part of the challenge for us is trying to work out how we can allow the science to develop in ways that will allow us to have those things while at the same time minimising any risks that might be there in the processes of development. Um, and the tricky part of that is that at the outset we often don't know what we don't know. Um, and because we don't know what we don't know when something is very new, I think that's why we have to often take things um, within, within sort of a regulated system. It's why we have to have laws and ethical debate um, happening right from the outset so that we can have systems in place that allow things to develop, um, that will allow us to review things on a regular basis so that as the science develops and as community values um, change over time, we can adapt those laws. But we need to sort of take things in a way that our, um, that takes account of our developing knowledge of a, of a new area. Um, and because we all want to share those benefits that, that science potentially brings us. Um, and that, that really is the exciting part of it. I mean, that, that, to have the, that new fuel, that cure for cancer, um, or, or some other wonderful thing that scientists have thought of that, that is beyond the realm of imagination for a mere lawyer. Um, and, you know, we, we all want those things, but we want them to be done in a way that, that is, you know, going to be safe for us all. Well, I couldn't wrap up any better than Belinda has. That's uh, that's very forward looking. I, I had uh, I had a, some mumbo jumbo that I was going to finish with, but that's just brilliant. That's really, really good. So, uh, congratulations.